Welcome to my talk on energy systems planning towards climate neutrality. So climate neutrality is talk of the town, as we all know, and it's a big challenge to meet this uh, objective within a short uh, period of time. But uh, uh, embarking on that way towards that, obviously, is uh, an ambition. And so you can go from zero to one. Let's uh, start with 0.5 until we really achieve full climate neutrality in the long term. So these are the four agenda items that I'm going to cover today. Climate neutrality has to be achieved across all scopes, and I'm going to tell you what scopes are about. Uh, that's a central element of my presentation of the day. And secondly, it's the technical system, and not only a single machine, of which we so see so many in Hanover, will uh, tip the scales in terms of uh, savings and, you know, always uh, bearing in mind efficiencies and what efficiencies can be tapped. We're going to look at, um, at what uh, factors uh, can be influencing uh, energy efficiency. Not many customers are uh, taking the holistic view. We want to change that. And then finally, we're going to talk about the business model of climate, climate neutrality. Not everyone is really uh, uh, comprehensively addressing that. We need to address uh, the notion that uh, a business model of climate neutrality is uh, not only a challenge for us as energy consultants, but also for suppliers. Those who are selling machines, systems, uh, production systems are always energy systems when you come to look at that. And um, that uh, also means that your business model has to be efficient rather than inefficient. So maybe you want to keep those agenda items on the top of your mind as you, as we present you the entire talk here. Now, just to give you a general idea about our company, let me tell you where we're coming from. We are, are related to the ETA, ETA factory at the University of Darmstadt. This has been mentioned before. The ETA factory was uh, set up as a concept in 2010. No one really believed in it. It was our brainchild. And then in between 2010 and 2012, um, I'm sure you will notice that all of the uh, industry shows were green. Everyone was talking about energy efficiency. So that was the time when we started our project as well. And this is when uh, people have developed uh, the general concept of the ETA factory. And then uh, 2013 saw the beginning of a, of a, of a standalone project. Um, energy efficiency in production was uh, a showcase model that we developed at the campus of the Technical University, Technical University of Darmstadt. And uh, in many ways, this is also about uh, efficiency, efficient connectivity of individual production items, uh, elements. Um, just earlier, we had a presentation uh, on energy networks and efficiency networks in the ETA factory. We heard about that. But we also developed the ETA transfer project. And that was created because the Federal Ministry of Economic Affairs had uh, funding uh, available, but no company that were claiming those funds. Now we wanted to match those. So government subsidies, efficiency programs, uh, and uh, an implementation arm of it. Now, uh, thanks to the successful work of the ETA factory, we've been in a position to make that a reality. And because it worked so well, we created um, the ETA Solutions GmbH, which is a corporate consultancy that is now five years old. And on we go. Until this very day, we work in the context um, of the uh, industry and Commerce Research Network. We are working together with the Federal Ministry of Economic Affairs, provide consultancy for funding schemes to make sure we dovetail the uh, available funding to the needs of our customers. And the demands and needs of the customers, obviously, are also changing. That's clear. But it's not only about energy efficiency, where we're coming from, but also uh, a couple of years ago, still, um, there were not too many people that were interested in energy efficiency and CO2. But now, transformation concepts have uh, become mainstream literally in the last two to five years, where people are focusing more now on uh, CO2 uh, neutrality. So you have a carbon footprint today, not necessarily the product carbon footprint, but a factory carbon footprint as a total operation facility. How can you shape that towards achieving neutrality in the carbon process? Now, that is something that is currently uh, preoccupying us a lot, uh, not only in research, projects, but also in real-life applications. 
Now, what would an energy consultancy look like? I'm just uh, touching on those top-line aspects here. But what is important, energy systems must be understood. So beginning from the individual com energy consumption of a component of a machine all the way to the system. So a pump, a tool uh, a machine, uh, a chiller, a control um, cabinet uh, coolant system, as we've heard before. This is where you start. Uh, we're not going to replace a, a machine, a complete machine, because uh, no one would do that just to buy a new uh, uh, machine tool just because uh, it is uh, more energy efficient. But if you do that, uh, you can actually calculate your individual savings, both in the procurement process, but also in the existing machine fleet. And then you can actually have an impact on what your machine fleet will look like. Implementing those savings is the second element here. It's what we help our customers with. So not only do you create transparency to understand what is happening, but you put it into reality with the uh, network of partners that we've developed over the years. And whenever we are at an industry show, obviously, it makes uh, a lot of sense to add more spices to the whole dish of energy systems. The next one is uh, shaping the transformation. Well, I said that before. This is not only about working on individual projects, but helping a company to support them to be climate neutral. And here comes the final aspect. Uh, we want to set off innova innovation. That's because of the history of our company. Um, what we offer can be really focused uh, to what people need to do. So you have your own uh, energy needs, energy reduction needs. Well, we help you in that to make sure that uh, they are compatible for the energy systems of the future and can be integrated in them as well, into them as well. So, uh, as I told you before that we are five years old, we have a team of eight people working in the company and supporting our customers towards climate neutrality. And uh, with all these other aspects here on the slide, I think uh, I've talked about them and can skip them. And what I'd really want to do is to talk about energy systems planning, which is the central aspect. Now, that's an animation that should uh, start right now. In a system like a factory, energy uh, is absorbed, but it also results in uh, exhaust heat. Actually, you see that uh, on the upper level there, on the higher level, but it happens inside a machine as well. So everything that's happening in a machine tool uh, is converted to heat. So all inefficiencies, in other words, uh, le would lead to additional power consumption. So that also leads to inefficient use of waste heat. Even when you have a productive process, there's always a certain built-in waste in the system. It happens on a machine level, on a component level. And one of our questions is, well, how can we use uh, waste heat from machines in order to be reused in an energy process? Like uh, cleaning uh, fluids, cleaning baths, for instance, can be heated using exhaust uh, heat from a machine. For those of you who uh, were following the earlier presentation from Marfac, well, this is exactly what they're doing and what we've been doing with them. So you can put your focus also on the entire factory. But in a factory, there's too much waste heat. Now, if you were not using air conditioning in this uh, factory or in this uh, exhibition hall here, you would uh, notice it's actually very hot. Uh, a machine emits 200 watts of uh, heat uh, per square meter, a floor heating only 80 watts. So imagine a factory hall is just as hot as a floor heating system working on full power. You cannot use it in the production machine, of course, but you could use it elsewhere. So what we do, we create transparency, as we've said before, and uh, what we also do, we're trying to market uh, those objectives. So um, we believe this is important uh, for all of our customers. In the sense, you not only do meaningful things, but you talk about it, uh, you spill the beans, use it as a marketing instrument uh, uh, for their own customers as well. And uh, that uh, brings us back full circle to the earlier business model that we talked about. Now, this again is the core aspect of energy systems planning in a nutshell, if you will. A conventional machine that loses a, uses a lot of energy and produces a lot of waste heat uh, becomes more efficient. And as you move over, the efficiency increases. 
So that's aspect number one. We want to bring energy consumption down, reduce waste heat. So if you avoid waste heat, you don't need to cool it down again with a chiller or an air conditioning system like in this in this exhibition hall. It is almost as you put a hot air blower into your fridge. So if you go back with your air blower from level three to two, you still will not adversely impact the effectiveness or the efficiency of a machine. So the same drying effect, if you will. But your refrigerator wouldn't need much more energy. So you use the waste heat of your hot air blower within the refrigerator to stay with that same picture. Now, in our case, we connect it to a cleaning uh, bath. We heard about that before in an earlier presentation of the day. And then finally, uh, you have uh, excess heat in a factory. Well, what do you do with that? If you're efficient, uh, you can either uh, dissipate it to the environment. You don't need any compressed uh, uh, refrigeration anymore, but you do that with the outdoor or free cooling. Or imagine you have a residential building uh, or a commercial building. Um, right next to your factory premises. Well, maybe you want to use the waste heat to heat those buildings there in order to conserve energy next to your factory. Now, all of that works not only in an academic context, but also with our, with our partners and customers that uh, we have worked with in those past year. And it works not only in the uh, machining industry or metal cutting industry, but also in the plastics in in industry. Uh, uh, Merck is a partner of us that uh, produces uh, 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 the pharmaceuticals, but then we have a customer that also produces uh, bitumen-based uh, roof covering. So the methodology of energy systems planning works for everyone, really, because it doesn't really matter where you consume energy, what industry whether it's metal cutting uh, or process industry, um, it really isn't that crucial because the general uh, approaches should be similar. So what are the results? Uh, so we've talked about that. Now, this is taken from a very specific uh, con uh, example from Trump, and we were allowed to uh, disclose the name of that uh, partner where we went through different aspects of energy. In this project, we, uh, or the, it, not relate, it doesn't relate to the entire manufacturing of that company, but uh, for that project, we save about 20,000 megawatt hours of, uh, so that's the total savings uh, of all projects, I should say, because otherwise for one project, 20,000 megawatt, uh, megawatt hours would be quite a lot. But uh, for the overall project to scope, uh, we are saving 10,000 tons of CO2 per year, always uh, compared to a reference building. I mean, you can never always build up two factories and use one for a good and the other one for a bad example. It's always a reference value, uh, which is related to the current uh, state of play, uh, that we have to submit to the BAFA before we get approval for the investment funding. Investment is larger than 20 million euros so far. So what that means, these are good. These are relevant projects in terms of their relative size for our partners. So high energy cost savings uh, related to uh, the project work. So a, a total factory will save you 10 to 20 percent of energy that is uh, very feasible and practicable. Especially for uh, electricity, it's slightly lower. But when you talk about, uh, talk about gas, uh, by using waste heat and recuperating it, um, the, we can save much more because you use that low temperature for building heating or for the cleaning uh, machines, the cleaning baths that we heard before. All of that can be recuperated from waste heat from machines and processes, which gives us a relatively high share of energy savings with a good ROI. Now, ROIs are always calculated to the time of when funding was applied for. And we know that energy costs uh, will develop, uh, uh, usually going up rather than down. So those ROIs uh, can get even better because of the increase in energy prices. I also told you that I'm going to talk about scopes. Uh, and I think uh, um, what are scope emissions and uh, what does it really mean? Um, in terms of climate neutrality. Well, let me start with that. Uh, climate neutrality is the zero net emissions of all processes in the factory and the uh, real net output. So it's a bit of a mouthful. No emissions within your own manufacturing process, but also within your own uh, products. So when you're building uh, fridges, they must not have emissions. And all precursor products shouldn't emit anything either. So that would be full uh, post-demoy climate neutrality, if you will. 
But uh, it wouldn't really work like that uh, if you do the calculation of the original element. So let's talk about the scopes. Scope 1 emissions are the direct emissions within your factory premises or company premises. So anything that is emitted out of the company by way of emissions, then there are indirect emissions that come from uh, utilities or electricity purchases, for instance, and scope 3 emissions are the ones re uh, referring to upstream or downstream products or the consumption and the use of your own product. Now, what exactly that means, I'll show you in a second. Our aspect that we're focusing uh, focus on is uh, improve the energy impact of the, thanks to your energy optimization within your organization. That's what we're focusing on. What you could also do is uh, work with companies uh, to, who, who became climate neutral overnight. Uh, that was uh, carbon compensation. Compensation works well, no doubt about it. But the question is, is that really a one-to-one -one compensation de facto or not? So it's more honest, if you will, to optimize your system with an energetic approach. But, you know, carbon uh, compensation is certainly not a mistake at all. What I haven't said yet is that um, companies that uh, achieve uh, uh, climate neutrality today just focus on scope one and two and they carve out scope three from this calculation. Now, let's make it more specific and tell you what it means. So what uh, happens within scope one in your internal uh, organization, it's uh, refrigerant losses, for instance. So refrigerants have a global warming potential, GWP for short, for those of you who have heard it before. So how do you account for those? Now, what about aspects of production machines, uh, compressed, compressed air, uh, process uh, fluids, etc.? These are not really found in scope one emissions, uh, but this is something that the company has a big handle on. And those are also depending on scope two elements, uh, so energy and utility uh, elements that you purchase. So this is the distinction of scope one and scope two, and your energy consultant needs to delineate one and the other. Now, I already indicated this, and uh, let me say again. If you wanted to achieve climate neutrality today, you would focus on the gray area, i.e. compensation measures. And there are companies uh, that uh, became uh, climate neutral overnight, and they did that uh, thanks to um, compensation or uh, green power purchasing. So green power certainly is in a position to do that, and um, energy efficiency or renewable energies in your own production or energy flexibility have uh, been playing a minor role. Although well, they, they are a relative contributor to that as well, but be it as it may, climate neutrality of tomorrow needs to focus on more aspects, uh, whereas energy efficiency has not been fully utilized, has not been tapped, well, not by our customers, they do that, but others who are not yet. Um, there is still some pent-up demand, I, I think, and they can uh, move a mountain by being more energy efficient. Uh, now, how much can be done has been shown to us uh, in the natural gas crisis. So imagine how much people have been able to minimize their gas consumption thanks to uh, optimizing your energy output. And um, we haven't hit a wall there yet. There's still potential to go from there. Renewable energies, no, I mean, that, that's a common place, uh, and it works really well, and it also works quickly. And then finally, energy flexibility, in the sense that you need to decide when you use your renewables in your production process, when do you have an excess, when is your CO2 factor low in the electricity grid, and then use that energy. And that is going to happen in the coming years, almost definitely. Yeah. Now, I'd like to refer you to our earlier project uh, with the Trumpf. Uh, Trumpf is a, a metal cutting competence center and a number of measures that we implemented with them. About 45 percent of uh, carbon emissions uh, were achieved or reduction was achieved, uh, about 800 tons per year in one single project. Now, you would say that uh, one person, one human, emits 10 tons of CO2 per year. 800 tons would be 80 people and their uh, equivalent of uh, carbon emissions. Now, how was that done? Well, I'm happy to talk about that. 
We replaced decentralized uh, machine chillers by highly efficient central uh, chillers or refrigerators. Machine chillers uh, really are the friends of energy consultants, and you can uh, roam the Hanover exhibition here and hold your hand over the chillers and see how much hot air comes out there. That's that hot air blower uh, sitting in your fridge that I mentioned before. And uh, it's one of the exhaust uh, uh, pipes of, um, of energy chillers. Uh, so uh, it's very important actually to feel that. Uh, don't just look at machines, uh, try and listen. It's usually where something is noisy and where it's hot. This is where energy is happening. I mean, obviously it makes sense, but not many people do that. And take a look and take a listen. So these chillers can be uh, uh, can be organized inefficiently. Bypass chillers are still very inefficient, or organize it uh, centrally. Rital uh, is a player that can do such a centralized solution. They have a good uh, booth here across uh, from here, or you use a centralized uh, system where you uh, use the waste hair of your machine uh, not to dissipate it to the air, but use it, turn it to, uh, into uh, a fluid, into water, and use it from there. If you're looking at 20 degrees of uh, temperature in a centralized chiller system, or 15 or 12, we're always uh, above what uh, geothermal energy or air-to-air -air heat pump would give you. Now imagine how much is going on at the moment here in this country on heat pumps, and rightly so. But if you have a 12 degree uh, cooling water throughout the year, that would be an excellent energy source, would it not? Also to use for other purposes. Now what else can we do? We could do um, uh, free cooling or... Uh, um, passive cooling, especially at night when we have uh, dry air, you can evaporate water and make a lot of cooling capacity available through cooling towers, but there are also hybrid coolers that are used as closed cooling towers. And this passive or free cooling uh, um, could be uh, these uh, dried cooling tower like shown in this picture, but they are depending on the external temperature, ambient temperature of well, and you can use those to use this 12 or 15 degrees uh, cooling water virtually without carbon emissions. If they're operated meaningfully, they have a factor of 30 to 50 of energy that you input into the system versus the output that can then be used as uh, refrigerant energy or uh, refrigeration output. And the third aspect is uh, the use of waste heat, as we said before. So heat recuperation uh, thanks uh, to the 12 or 15 degrees uh, temperature levels for your internal purposes within your energy system. You see a larger picture of how it all works together. It's, it's a schematic that is very complex. We cannot avoid complexity in the system. But conversely, you could always say, thanks to technology, that's always the hope, thanks to the ongoing development of technology, we can make a major contribution towards more energy efficiency. And there are other aspects as well, as you see there in the list on the right, is uh, you can replace inefficient uh, auxiliary systems like uh, machine uh, cooling systems, uh, control cabinet coolers, as we've heard before, hydraulic applications. That's an aspect as well. Uh, hydraulics are always the noisy component. So if you stand next to a machine, well, this is where you hear where hydraulics is at work. And there are many things, and I'm not going to read them out now for you, because we'll be running out of time if I did. So uh, what's uh, the upshot uh, with our RI of three and a half years and the investment grants we've received? Those grants, mind you, are not only available for SMUs, but also small, uh, larger, larger companies. Um, so um, we, uh, you, you see the indicators there in the slide. And I said before, uh, transformation concepts are one aspect. So uh, can we achieve the 2030 target of the energy transition with the measures we have in place today? Well, the answer is straightforward. The objectives uh, are achievable already today with the measures that are in place uh, in one step of iteration. So that's the entire project uh, with Trumpf that I mentioned before. So if we don't just uh, stop with one project but use the entire transformation horizon, but with all the measures that exist today, we could already achieve the 2030 uh, uh, climate targets. And we didn't even mention the replacement of machinery uh, or revamping. So integration in terms of integration, 
you could do even more. So I am confident, in other words, that we can achieve the 2030 targets with the existing tools we have available today. And with that, I hope I was able to tell you that climate neutrality has to be embraced across all the different scopes, not only scope one or scope two, because theoretically, if you want to be integrated, you'd have to look at your precursors, your upstream and downstream products, because once you market them, uh, throwing their life cycle, they consume energy as well, so they want to be uh, efficient. Secondly, the technical system decides, not only an individual machine, it's not about your hair dryer or your hot air blower that's sitting in the fridge somewhere that should be more efficient, but uh, at the end of the day, the fridge itself as well. So it's a systems integrated view or an air conditioning system like in this uh, exhibition hall here today. You need to know what your levers and influences are. It's important for all industry players to know what they can to do themselves, what their energy uh, consumption is. You have to be flexible to know what you're doing, to, of course, know what you can be doing going forward. And if you're flexible enough, you can invite external expertise who will help you to find another solution. And finally, something I'd like to invite all of you to, uh, uh, to work shoulder to shoulder and understand how your business model of climate neutrality would look like. How can you set a distinct profile for yourselves to compete with others in order to drive climate neutrality forward. It is not only a business model for energy consultants, in other words. What would that business look like in the future? Well, in this uh, word cloud, you see quite a few things that will be on the agenda going forward. And we believe where we are coming from, energy efficiency and CO2 emissions, something that has been uh, talk of the town for many years now. CO2, I think, uh, will uh, uh, diminish in relevance by 2030 because we already will be having 80 percent of renewable energies in electricity production by that time. So CO2 will not be uh, on the agenda so much. But you need to understand how much energy you consume, how many more renewables you need. Uh, I mean, if you reduce uh, your energy consumption by 50 percent, you don't need much more renewable energy going forward. And when do you need that renewable energy? At what time? At uh, what place? That is something that we will need to address after 2030 more so than today, assuming that uh, the legislator plays along. And as far as transformation concepts, um, maybe not only think about your roof-mounted uh, solar energy panels, but think energy efficiency instead. And here's my final slide to give you an outlook uh, and quote from an existing study. What are the current drivers for energy efficiencies? And that's a questionnaire that was sent to industry players, uh, but also um, energy consultancy for residential areas, where everyone is saying that uh, the political uh, conditions will matter, the political environment. Uh, the political environment is actually quite clear. It has been uh, defined, it's very statically defined for the residential business, but they are also evolving. Um, as far as uh, energy prices are concerned with the war on Ukraine, uh, we've uh, seen quite a few challenges uh, during gas, uh, the gas crisis. We didn't need any additional funding because uh, there was a lot of subsidies available. And we do not necessarily claim subsidies for all of our projects. But then there's also more of an awareness of more sustainability uh, across the board by people of all walks of life. We need more technological innovation. That is certainly true as well, despite the fact that we're in a good shape today already. A lot of tools are available. And finally, we need to reach out to the customer demands of the future. If only uh, only when the expectation by customers for efficient systems can be uh, satisfied will we be making progress. Now, even if you leave out, loud, leave out 2022, you can still say on the right of the slide that energy prices will be going, uh, going up. Anywhere between 21 and 2023, this number will still go up. And um, I think we are safe to assume that uh, that's not uh, the end of the story yet. Uh, energy prices will continue to increase. Therefore, we need energy efficiency to achieve uh, finally our 2040 targets. Thank you very much for your attention. I'm happy to.